Um, it's an absolute huge privilege uh, to be here this morning. Thank you so much to Angela. Thank you to Evelyn over there who's been chatting to me over the last week or two and getting me up to speed with all the fantastic work that's going on in, in Scotland. So it's an absolute privilege uh, to be here. Um, I often think we probably don't make enough of the fact that in practice we've got four different public service systems in the UK and we don't do quite enough learning from across the different parts of the UK. So it's a fantastic opportunity for me just to hear about what, you, what you're up to in Scotland. And I was just going to take 20 minutes or so, as Angela says, just to um, talk a little bit about what's happening in England at the moment, some of the pitfalls of what we've done, some of the good things maybe in what we've done. So I don't really come to recommend the English model or to bury the English model. I just come in to come in the spirit of learning, really, um, and tell you how it's worked. Um, I think all the things we've done have got some pros and we've probably got some cons as well. But um, my sense is, from talking to colleagues over the last week or two about your event today, is actually the vision's quite similar uh, in, the two, uh, in the two countries. So I think we're going about it in a particular way. So let's see if there's any, uh, any food for thought for all of us in that, uh, in that, in that journey. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about what we're up to uh, in England. And really, more I'm going to try and focus on what we've learned from the last few years of work on the public health uh, agenda uh, in England. Um, so just briefly, a potted account of the public health system uh, uh, in England. So really, big sea change in about 2012, when we had the Health, health and Social Care Act uh, in England in, in 2012. Before that, public health was, uh, as a function, was located in the NHS. You know, we have commissioner provider itis in England, so it's kind of part of the commissioning uh, structure um, in the NHS. Lots of places up and down in England, though, had joint arrangements of public health. So quite often, the local authority would be jointly appointing the director of public health, even though the, the director of public health and the team sat within the NHS. So we had lots of examples where people work together. But coalition government came along in 2010 and the deal they did on the NHS, I'm not sure anyone quite planned the deal, but anyway, it ended up where it ended up, with a bit of Lib Dem influence and a bit of Conservative influence. So we ended up with the public health profession, as it were, transferring into, into local government. We ended up with a ring fence grant uh, for each local authority to spend uh, on public health. We had, we had a public health outcomes framework nationally that talked about all the outcomes that we were all expected to work on. We had something called mandation, which was a sort of um, jargon way of saying there's some things every area is going to do <laughs> and the government's going to uh, try and make sure that we all do it. We also had health and well-being boards set up. These were interesting beasts, which are kind of councillors, chief execs of hospitals, um, see clinical commissioning groups, so the kind of commissioning body in England for health services, so brought them together as well. We have an organisation called Health Watch, which is the, the modern in, incarnation of the kind of patient voice in the NHS. Um, so all those people sit around with councillors and director of public health, director of adult services, director of children's services, all sit around in a, in a board in each of our local areas across across England. So. That's the sort of bones of the, uh, of the system. Um, also got Public Health England, which is the kind of national quango that, that sort of technically leads on public health uh, across the whole of, of England. I know you're currently working on a kind of national framework and national institutions as well, haven't you? So we've had uh, four or five years now of Public Health England uh, setting a kind of policy and evidence base uh, for, for public health uh, activity. So that's the bare bones of what we've, what we've done. The vision that animated all of that, I think, seems to me to be reasonably consistent with, with what, uh, what you're passionate about, the vision in, in Scotland. So it was all about trying to address the context of health, not dealing with problems of health when they've already manifested themselves. It was all about the social determinants of health. It was all, all about trying to change communities, not, not trying to prescribe medicines and prescribe interventions after people have already uh, become unwell. There was a vision around inequality as well. 
um, of, of, of trying to uh, equalise health outcomes across different communities. Um, you know, we've got radically different mortality um, uh, in different parts of uh, different parts of England, and people's healthy life expectancy is quite different as well across different parts of England. In my borough, just in one London borough, um, we've got a nine or ten year difference uh, across our borough from the poorest parts of healing to the to the wealthiest in terms of the public health, uh, in terms of life expectancy. So, um, and I think it was all about place, not institutions that was the, the, the you know what we described uh, as being the, the approach that we were, we were trying to take I think bringing local government into the fold as well uh, much more was designed uh, certainly in England we uh, we take the view unfair or otherwise that local government tends to be closer to its community than perhaps in the NHS sometimes is um, you know the NHS is a much more nationally driven system in England so the feeling was in terms of community empowerment community development local government could bring something to that uh, to that part so, so that was the animating vision and um, I always uh, I, I'm, all of you I'm sure know Professor Michael Marmot I always hang on to, to his kind of advice on these matters so he always says you know that the key issues on public health are income levels Good start in life, decent job, decent education and skills, a decent place with leisure opportunities, community connections, good housing, uh, and some good services that underpin that. So when you look at that kind of list, good job, good start in life, income, education and skills, uh, a good place, that really is called local government territory, isn't it? And that is also the primary drivers of the public health uh, agenda. So there's a certain logic. And apart from all of that, the uh, reforms in England were also designed to try and better integrate the health and social care system uh, across the country as well. So we set ourselves quite a, quite a tall order. Um, as you'd expect, we, we've in truth had a mixed uh, result from all the, the activity that's, that's, that's gone on. Um, some of the opportunities that I think we've, we've, tried, to, we've tried to grasp uh, as we've wrestled with it over the last three or four years. The first thing is, the way I describe it, this is trying to hitch the political engine to the public health train. So I think uh, putting democrat connecting democratic accountability to the public health system seems to me to be a really powerful opportunity. So much of what we've got to do in public health is not just saying to the public, here's the state giving you something. Public health is about changing the way people behave, trying to help people to change the way they live their life. And I think it's a tremendous asset if that's the agenda to have a political democratic voice leading, um, leading on that. So I think that's a huge um, opportunity that we've tried to, that we've tried to grasp. Um, we've tried to really uh, make some of the obvious connections um, that you would expect. So we've really tried to use the local authority connections to schools, to bring schools into the public health system and to be self-conscious about being part of the public health system. You know, one of those uh, Marmot principles is a good start. Um, well, of course, schools are such an important part of that, of that system. So thinking about the schools can make a role. We still have a big network of children's centres uh, in England, again, where we, we, we try to connect them um, into the agenda. A really important opportunity has been around regeneration, <coughs> economic development. So, some of the best examples of local government grasping the nettle on public health has been the regeneration agenda, where we've really thought that we, we've got so many different names for plans across the UK. But you know, our local spatial vision is that what we is that a general way of describing the things that we do? But anyway, the spatial vision of the place and the planning policies that go with it, there's such a tremendous set of opportunities there about designing health in to development. Uh, Dividing health into our communities, space for cycling, space for leisure, space, space for the parks. We've got a tremendous canal network in Ealing. Uh, we, um, we've got canals flowing right through the park. We're really trying to take them from being a place that people are scared to go to being a, a place where there's an opportunity to, to live a healthy life, to cycle, to do activity. We have yoga clubs now around the banks of the canal and so forth. So there's real opportunities around the physical place and what you, uh, what you can do. We obviously run regulatory services and again tremendous opportunities there um, around trading standards, around regulation, um, etc. Um, leisure and parks, an obvious part of the offer. 
Um, our, our role as well around loneliness and connecting people into their communities, community networks, again, is at the heart of local government, connected to that community engagement piece that I talked about earlier. earlier. So, in sort of service terms, in functional terms, that's where we've been really trying to push hard over the last three or four years to make a difference in those areas. None of those professions, uh, LARP, you know, leisure parks, regulatory, regeneration, you know, these are not people who four years ago would have necessarily said, I'm in the public health workforce. But the job has been to try and say to them, no, you're the core of the public health workforce in, in our local areas. Um, really interestingly, I think it's also, I'm not sure we knew this when we got into it, perhaps some of us got a glimpse of it, it's really required a different model of leadership for local places as well, I think. I'm not sure we knew it um, at the time. But, you know, nobody owns a public health outcome. No institution, no service, no profession owns those outcomes, does it? Lots of people contribute. So it really requires a collaborative mode of, of leadership. That's what, we've, that's what we've found. It requires a lot of creativity. Because it's not about running services, it's about trying to tackle outcomes, and that's a different question, and it requires quite a creative approach. As I mentioned earlier, we found that it, that it really has given energy to that kind of active citizen idea. This is not the state giving you something as a passive recipient of a state service. This is the state working alongside you, saying, how can we help you? improve your life, improve your health uh, outcomes. So it's really given focus to that. And I think as, an inst as institutions, it's given us a really stronger impetus to really try and be about outcomes and not about process. You know, we are all the NHS, local government, we are quite big organisations, aren't we? Quite old organisations. We can be quite bureaucratic organisations. I think the public health agenda gives us a chance to try and get a bit beyond that and think about impact in a really serious, uh, in a really serious way. Um, so, to take examples of a number of councils in England, Ealing included, we've made the public health framework our strategic framework for the council and for the place. So now when I have my appraisals with my directors in Ealing, the public health framework is written into all the, into the, all the job descriptions, all the appraisals of all my directors uh, right across the council, whether they're working on benefits administration, on the environmental services, in regeneration, etc. So, you know, um, when, when talking to my director of public health, you know, my, my mantra to him is always, your job is to make this everybody else's job, not to hoard it uh, in, in, in your area. So there's been a real opportunity to change the way we do leadership and to change the culture of the organisation and the place. Also, um, I don't think we've grasped this yet, but also big opportunity about data. So, local government, we're a holder of lots of data about our people, but public health connection um, and that, uh, to, to local authority gives us the opportunity to think in a richer way about data and in a richer way about evaluation. I think local government folk on the whole, are quite, we're quite practical and we like getting the task done, but I think public health has been a really powerful driver in saying we have to go a bit beyond getting the task done. We have to figure out what we've actually achieved as a result of getting the, the task done. We've also used behavioural science better and more. Interestingly enough, that's not always been driven by the public health team. Um, I, when, I, when, I, when we first started working together, I did say to the public health team, I really want you to get behavioural science into the core of the council, figuring out how we do things in a way that nudges people uh, in terms of their behaviour. Uh, that's been quite hard work, but we, we have built those skills in the council, gradually built some of that knowledge um, over time. Um, so, I think those are some of the, the opportunities, the, the best examples in England of, of, of grasp as a result of the, um, the changes that we made. In terms of some of the challenges, and then after I've done the challenges, I'll just try and give you a, four or five examples of some of the best practice that we've that we found in, uh, in England. I always think it's trying to, best to end on an optimistic note, isn't it? That's uh, always good. So, in terms of the challenges, um, I think the, the, there's been a big, um, so we decided to do this structurally a bit in England, quite a big structural change attached to this vision. Um, inevitably, structural change made people a bit anxious, and it meant for a few months at least, people were as much focused on the structure and the uh, future in it as they were on public health outcomes. So, you know, whatever the pros and cons, there was that sort of anxiety about, uh, about structural change. 
given what I've said, um, I don't think structural change is the main point, no, in all of this. It really is about culture. It's about how we lead, uh, not about you know, how we organise ourselves. Because there's no organisational structure that encompasses what you're trying to achieve with public health. You've got to do it in a partnership, you've got to do it in a collaboration. There might be better and wor worse structures to do that, but it's not really a structural question in my, in my view. Um, there's a skills and a culture point. Um, I think both for local government professions and the public health professions, you know, sometimes it can be a bit, you know, people from different planets just kind of gradually feeling each other out and, you know, what values animate them. The language that people talk can be a bit, on both sides, you know, on all sides can be a bit opaque. And it's taken us a while to make the best of those different skills and, and, and cultures. Um, I think um, one of the things that we've attempted to achieve is cashable savings as a result of, a, of, a, of this kind of vision of public health. Um, I don't think we've, we've achieved that. Uh, there might be one or two areas in England that claim to have achieved it. But, you know, the promise is always there. If you do more of this great stuff around tackling inequalities, around tackling in health, ill health, at some point, so it is claimed there's a cash dividend for somebody at the end of it in public services, be it the NHS, be it local government. I don't think we've we found that. Uh, so we haven't we haven't enabled this to make cashable savings for us. That's not to say that there aren't examples where evaluation suggests we might have stemmed some demand into the system, but that's not quite the same as the cashable saving that my director of finance often searches for in these uh, in these conversations. So I would be cautious about claims to do with cashable savings. I think it's been tricky in terms of governance and accountability. So, um, as I mentioned before, I've been trying to make all my directors, everybody in the council, accountable uh, for public health, but trying to really isolate what people bring to the party, what their accountabilities are for making a difference, and then trying to isolate what you've done and how that's really changed an outcome. That is quite a complicated process. So our accountability structures are not, are not easy and holding to account, them. you know, that's one of the challenges of caring about outcomes, I think, rather than process and outputs. So that's not easy. And in governance terms, we have the thing that I mentioned called our health and wellbeing boards locally. Um, I think they've helped at their best to connect up leadership, get a shared vision. But we don't really do shared decision making in those, in those forums. Um, the and that's partly a legal question. So usually the, the legal decision on any given investment or any given change that we want to make either flows back to the local authority or it flows back into the NHS. So still a bit cumbersome sometimes, I think, the, the governance. So anything you can do in Scotland to kind of overcome that, I think we, we'd be really interested in. Um, austerity has been a factor in this. Um, so trying to do, trying to really care about public health outcomes in a world where every service that's uh, connected to these outcomes is having reductions one form or another that makes this a more complicated agenda no doubt about that certainly if your view of the world is that what you need to do is invest up front to generate returns down down the line getting hold of that investment uh, up front is harder in the world that we're in at the moment isn't it although you know uh, many places have done that in England many places across the NHS and local government set up or, you know, whatever you want to call them, transformation funds, or the better phrase, that are invested in some of these outcomes. But I think success requires that up, that investment up top, so it is an important part of it. I, I don't think our ambition has been uniform across England. I think some places have not been as ambitious as others um, in grasping the opportunities here. Um, so some of it feels, um, you know, at our worst, we treat public health, and public health sometimes treats itself as being about delivering a few specific services, stop smoking, drug and alcohol intervention, sexual health services, etc. Now, colleagues, don't misunderstand me. These are incredibly important services. Uh, but that is not, we are not making the best of the public health agenda, if that's what we're focused on. And in too many places, I think in England, we've, we tended to stay in our comfort zone and say we've always commissioned these services, we've always organised these services and that's what we're mainly going to focus on. So I don't think in, in part we've been ambitious enough and that, and that ambition requires a stretch of the public health system and public health professionals as well as other professionals in the, uh, in the system.
Um, that hasn't been helped in England by this idea that we've got a mandate of certain things we've got to do and a, a ring fence budget. So I would, I think the ring fence budget has been a really bad idea for public health because what it's done is encourage people to think that the ring fence budget is the public health budget when the opportunity we've got here is that, you know, I spend, I've got 250 million pound revenue budget in England Council, that should be the public health uh, investment, not 20 million or 15 million that's ring fenced in the ground. So I think that's been a mistake doing that. And I think it's encouraged people to focus too, too narrowly um, sometimes. And I think the national local partnership has not always been as strong as it, as it might be. So one of the things I've been really encouraged about hearing about you, the fantastic work you're all doing is what seems to me to be a real opportunity for a genuine partnership across the Scottish Government and local government uh, and the NHS. I don't think we've got that right in England. Um, so, you know, we know that there are some things only national government can do. We've lobbied very hard around uh, sugar tax, um, around advertising for children. Uh, we've lobbied very hard around gambling in local government, all which we see as public health issues. And we can't solve those things in our local areas entirely. It needs government action. And I don't, that's, that, can, that can be quite hard work sometimes. So that's some of the challenges, and I'll just finish off if it's okay, Angela, on just a few um, a few examples of, of things that I think are particularly interesting. Um, very happy if it's helpful afterwards. We can connect you into the places that have done this. You know, there are websites, there are documents, etc. If any of this is interesting. So one of the things we've been pioneering in the last few years is the concept of health in all our policies uh, across the local area. So it's a toolkit that we've developed across England, which is all about saying. Whatever the policy that local authorities are de uh, developing, whether it's your local development framework, your regeneration strategy, your adult social care strategy, your, you know, how you, how you look after children, etc. There's a toolkit that uh, local authorities use now up and down the country, which is all about how you embed public health principles and how you embed the public health outcomes into the work you do across all those policies. And we've got some fantastic examples. Uh, you know. Uh, Personally, I think the regeneration stuff is some of our biggest achievements um, in England. There are some boroughs that absolutely embedded the public health thinking into the way they're thinking about their place, into the way they're thinking about economic development, and it's really impressive stuff, some of it, so I would, I would really commend it to you. Um, so, health in all our policies and that kind of local spatial planning, we've got some really good um, examples of that. We've also got some really interesting examples. In, in, I'm sure it's the same in Scotland. It, you know, in England, what we're trying to do is really invest and develop our community services to take some of the heat out of the, the pressures in the acute system. And we've got some really good examples where the local council and the NHS have jointly commissioned some new, a new community service arrangement in the, lo in the locality. And what they've asked that, public, uh, that community service organisation to do is they've, they've asked for it to be judged according to the Public Health Outcomes Framework. So not the usual set of things that you ask of the district nurse or um, you know, the colleagues in community services. It's, it's actually connecting it to the Public Health Outcomes Framework because saying the job of community services to deliver that framework. So some really interesting examples. We've got some great examples that you'd expect of community capacity building, a community development, a community empowerment. So the idea is not the council or the NHS doing this to the community, it's trying to get champions within the community who advocate uh, uh, this uh, agenda. So some really interesting work um, we've done there. I think we've made a better go, from a local authority point of view, of thinking about the digital agenda in public health as well. The NHS in England doesn't have always the best track record in terms of implementing IT solutions and digital solutions. And I think we've been able to be a bit more organic about that across our local areas. So we've got some fantastic new models around sexual health services and access to sexual health services via a digital route, which is really uh, excellent. But, but we've had a pan-London piece of work as well to recommission uh, sexual health services. I mean, they were of mixed quality, but to be honest, they usually were delivered by the acute trusts, by the hospitals, and quite often that money wasn't being put to best use through those contracts that we had. So we've really reshaped how we've done that, and we've made it uh, importantly quite a digital offer as well. And I'm really proud as well that 
through local government collectively, we've really championed um, changes around gambling, uh, changes around taxation of sugary drinks and sugary products, um, ch and changes around advertising as well. And I think that's local government at its best, actually saying we've got a responsibility in this area. It's a very broad responsibility. And part of our job is to work collaboratively with national government to make national change as well as local change. So that's a bit of a flavour of what we've been up to uh, in England. I hope it's of some interest. Um, I'm hugely impressed with the hard work that you're all doing in, in Scotland, and it's been a great privilege to, to be here today. So thank you, and I hope we get a chance for a little bit of dialogue as well. Thank you. I guess what was a four or five year job, maybe we, we got to hear about in, in, in 20 minutes, but lots of parallels and, and, and lots of things for, for, for us to, to prompt out a wee bit more. So I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, it doesn't have to be a question, just a comment or a, or a reaction, but equally if you want to put a question up, so that's So show of hands, I'm going to struggle at the back. I think, um, Mark, as I mentioned, so we can move this flip chart down down at the front and we get to the back that would be great. That's all here? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Paul. I think we've got, we've got a microphone now as well. So can you put it in the back? Thank you very much, Paul. I'm uh, Tim Patterson, I'm Director of Public Health with the Health Board, but also with the Scottish Borders Council. So we have an integrated public health function. Um, and I was really impressed, I think, I think you've highlighted some of the successes, but also the challenges. And um, I think we have some thinking and learning to do um, in response to that. Um, I'm quite interested in your health and all policies, because I'm aware of the toolkit, um, which has been used down in England uh, and uh, I'm particularly interested in the health and all policies framework in Scotland, and particularly in, in my own council. Uh, I think one of the important things we have to do, and it's what we discussed earlier on at our table, is raising awareness and the vision that you've put forward, uh, and put forward by other speakers, that it's really everybody's responsibility is important. So I think there is a big training requirement. I think the toolkit was extremely useful, uh, and certainly whenever we have used it, to actually raise awareness of how everything is interconnected, and how we must avoid silos, and how that these complex problems can really only be resolved uh, or uh, mitigated by actually working together. So I think that toolkit is something we should be thinking about in Scotland, and I'll be having some discussions with my own public health colleagues about whether we could partnerize some of those ideas because I think it is a useful way of raising awareness and seeing, making connections between the, the, the goal and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and then the individual roles that people have within local authorities and other local agencies. So it was good to hear that you think that that's an important tool and I think it's something that we should be thinking of locally in Scotland. Just to offer a comment, Angela, on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's really interesting to hear your perspective. And I think um, one of the great opportunities in all of this is I think it takes you back to public service values, uh, the public health agenda. That's one of the reasons I really warm to it. So it's been a pretty tough eight, nine years, hasn't it, one way or another across public services. And I think the great thing that the public health agenda offers us is a chance to kind of reconnect for our staff and our organisations back into kind of purpose, you know, why people get out of bed in the morning. So I think the best councils have not necessarily said in England, hello, here am I the chief exec or whatever, I'm here to talk to you about public health, how it comes from, the public health agenda. What, we, what, I think the best, what I think the best examples do is say, we care about impact, we care about outcomes, we care about equality. Um, isn't that what we want to shoot at as an organisation? And it's actually just kind of connecting people to that purpose. Uh, and then when you've kind of had that conversation about purpose, which is really the, 
the purpose of the public health agenda gives you. You then, the next stage is, and here's some tools, you know, things like health in all our policies. That's a very helpful practical tool that you can give people. And it really has proved useful. Because when you start winning the hearts and minds, people very quickly start asking questions. Like, how can I? How can I do this? You know, I'm an environmental health officer. You know, how can I make use of this? And, and so having some practical tools is, is really valuable at that point. For, for that. Ken, any other questions, comments, reactions? Right, I'm going to ask it. Of course, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you. I found that quite inspirational, actually, in terms of what we've been talking about this morning, and probably touched on some of the things we were talking about um, at our table, so maybe reinforcing as well. We're on the right path and with the same issues, but actually to get the opportunity to learn from that. Sorry, eh, to get the opportunity to learn from that is invaluable. Thank you. Well, I think the um, learning is quite an important word, word in the context of public health, I think, because I, I was hoping when, uh, and of course I knew my public health director before we had all the structural changes, but I was hoping on day one I'd sit down with my director of public health and I'd say, right, better housing, better jobs, better incomes. You must know how to do all this. And you, you know, you've written the plan already. Um, but the truth is, when you're trying to tackle outcomes, nobody really, you know, there isn't, you know, public health is rich in evidence, but, that, but that's not always the same as saying public health is rich in evidence about what works to make a difference to the outcome. And therefore you have to adopt, you have to take a bit of a risk, I think, and you have to take a learning approach. Um, so, you know, I, I do think experimentation is re and learning is an incredibly important part of this. And, it, and it's, not, um, it's not sort of training in the old fashioned sense of somebody stands up at the front who knows the answer and who can tell people how to do it. It is genuinely collaboration, I think, across professions and, and, and try to build learning. So, I, you know, I think it's quite a, what I'm doing since I love it. It, I love this whole agenda is because it gives you a good way to do change and it gives you a good way to improve public <coughs> services. So it's a great, it's a great opportunity. Great. Any other hands at the back? Do you want to get your microphone? It's okay, I'll be quite quick. Um, I just wonder if there's any examples of behavioural change. You talked about where you use the nudge um, and drawing the behavioural science. Are there any examples that are quite interesting for us? So it was examples of behavioural change, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have a number um, across England that we've, we've brought together. Uh, we've, we, every year we do a kind of annual report on kind of interesting stuff in, in public health. So we've got a number. Um, and they're often in uh, physical activity area. So we've got some really interesting examples where people have done a lot of hard work in particular communities to really change uh, patterns of physical activity. We've also got some quite good examples about car use. Air quality is quite a big agenda now in, in English cities. Uh, so increasingly thinking about cycling, thinking about how you design the public space to get people out of their cars. Uh, we've got some really good examples of that uh, as well. So those, those are a couple of the main areas. So I can point you to specific localities that have done it. The challenge is, I think, the scale, how you scale it up. So what we've got are quite a really interesting, uh, thoughtful examples in particular neighbourhoods or particular communities. The challenge is how you keep it going and how you scale it across a city or an area. You know, uh, that's the bit where we haven't, we haven't quite cracked it. Especially you'll appreciate things like transport. It's a kind of, you know, you, you can make a bit of progress in a neighbourhood or in a small geographic location, but it's usually a much bigger systemic issue, isn't it? So um, those have been some of the better uh, areas. We've got, you know, like you in Scotland, we've got some good examples around stop smoking um, as well. Um, and some of the sexual health work we've done has been quite innovative in trying to not just engage with people when they've, you know, uh, when they're in difficulty, but trying to trying to work with people upstream. So we've got we've got pockets of really interesting learning, and the, the, the challenge for the system now, I think, is scaling it up. I was going to ask a question first, because I guess that I, I was struck in the same way that you were, just the parallel. And I, I just wondered if for this audience you could just 
say a wee bit more around as the system felt that anxiety in response to the structural bit. What did that kind of look and feel like, and how did the collective overcome that and start to move? Because you've painted a lovely rosy picture now, after mm. having kind of swept through a few, few years. But what was just on pattern, I guess, what made the difference to help at that locality level? Because I guess that's where we're all going to start to really focus on. Well, I think the, um, usually in any kind of cultural <coughs> change or any structural change, there are a few myths get going quite early on, aren't they? So there was one myth that, I don't know if anyone really holds these views, but it's kind of helpful to name them, isn't it? So one myth was that there would be, there would be councillors who couldn't wait to get their hand on public health services and do all sorts of weird and wonderful things that had nothing to do with evidence, that were all politically driven, whatever that means, you know, and so, but would, you know, so one myth was politicians are interested in evidence. There was a myth that, um, I don't know if anyone held it in local authorities, oh, this public health thing, the NHS hasn't made much of a go of it over the years, so we're going to get it now, and we're going to, we'll own it, we'll, we'll kind of shepherd it now, and we'll sort it all out, and, you know, shake it all out. So that was another, um, that was another uh, sort of myth that, 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 that was around. Um, I think for public health colleagues, there was a fear they'd be a bit isolated in the local authority. There was a fear that, you know, we're, we're medically trained people, often, <coughs> We sit in an organisation in the NHS that's full of other people who've got up some of our backgrounds, some of our shared traditions. So I think, I think they were the myths that were around. And myths usually are sort of a percentage true, aren't they? But they're not totally true. So what we did in those places that have worked well, and it is very variable, colleagues, it is really variable. Uh, the best places have got people together early on and ask people to kind of voice those fears, <laughs> voice those, the myths, if you like, what's your worst nightmare and what could happen as a result of this? And got people to articulate that. Um, and uh, so you get it in the room, don't you? And, and then you can self-consciously try and work in a way to counter uh, those myths. And actually, if anyone does slip into the behaviours that are not helpful, it enables you to say, well, do you remember when we first met? Well, I was a bit worried about that. That felt to me a bit like that. So, you know, um, so I think really it's about that kind of honesty. Um, in truth as well, it was very different. What, what local government, what, what, what the inheritance of public health is quite different in different places. Um, public health had been disinvested in, in some parts of England, when public health was part of the NHS. Um, so it's a very mixed, it was a very mixed sort of picture. Um, and some places started from quite a lot from quite a low base. So I think what I'm describing to you is the best places have understood those fears and tried to counter them, uh, and tried to deliberately work counter, typically, in that sense. Um, but not everywhere has worked perfectly. And some of those, some of those ingrained, some of the ingrained mistrust perhaps has persisted in some parts. I don't know if that's really an answer to the question. What's um, it's really helpful, and I just ask colleagues in the room to think about in the car park space that Mark put up in the, the back that we're all thoughtful about what are our fears and anxieties if we do have any, and that we kind of put them on the on the table so we can start to, to talk about them and start and start start to hear them. Um, Paul, I think that's been an incredibly um, rich contribution that that, that we've made today. I'm I'm kind of sorry that. We're not able to, to hear you for long. I think you're staying for long. I am, uh, for, for a bit. And while we all go and do our daily mile of our, of our lunch, <laughs> uh, while, while we all do that and have some healthy lunch, uh, you're very welcome to join us. And I just encourage colleagues to talk to Paul while he's here and just hear a wee bit more about, about that experience. But please join me in thanking Paul for his contribution.